When I first became a Christian at age 17, I did not know anything about how to follow Jesus. All of the basic spiritual practices, coming to church and participating in worship, reading the Bible, praying, all of that was totally new to me. And yet I dove in. I started to engage in those practices. And I found something exciting begin to happen. God began to change me. I could see that my personality and my character were growing. I was actually experiencing spiritual growth. And I got really excited because it was an affirmation for me that my faith was real, that God was alive and he was at work in me. And because I was growing and changing, I wanted everybody to know about it. Now, it's one thing to share with someone what God is doing in our lives. And it's another thing entirely to brag about it. And I started bragging. I became very prideful about the ways that I was changing. And here's what's even worse. After hanging around with Christians for a while, I picked up a lot of Christian lingo. And I observed that Christians often behaved in certain kinds of ways. And so at times, I began acting even more spiritual than I was in order to impress people. And so, for example, in my, my life group, my small group, I would volunteer to pray out loud. And then I would offer these long, flowery prayers filled with religious language. Because I wanted people to know that I was good at prayer. If I heard two people talking about the Bible, I'd find my, a way to interject myself into that conversation so they would know how much I knew about the Bible. You see, what happened is this. I had shifted my focus away from God. And I'd shifted my focus onto other people in an unhealthy way. I was seeking approval from the crowd rather than simply trying to live a life of faith and honor God. And that kind of behavior is prideful and it's hypocritical. And if we fall into that kind of behavior, it's dangerous to us. It's dangerous to others. It's damaging because it's not a genuine expression of faith. I'm so very thankful that some older, wiser believers came alongside me and graciously shared with me in love so that I could see the trap into which I'd fallen. And they walked me through the very Bible passage that we're going to look at this morning. It's a part of the Sermon on the Mount where Jesus urges us not to become consumed by pride. He urges us to avoid hypocritical behavior and to live a life of spiritual humility. I think there's wisdom here for all of us. So let's see what we can learn from Jesus. Matthew chapter 6, starting in verse 1. Jesus says, Be careful not to practice your righteousness in front of others to be seen by them. If you do, you will have no reward from your Father in heaven. So, when you give to the needy, do not announce it with trumpets, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and on the streets, to be honored by others. Truly, I tell you, they've received their reward in full. But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your giving may be in secret. Then your Father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. Now let's remember that Jesus is preaching to a huge crowd here. Multitudes of men and women have followed him up onto a mountainside because they're eager to hear what he has to say. These are people who are spiritually curious and spiritually hungry. They're, they're eager to get more closely connected to God. And so Jesus has been telling them throughout this sermon in a variety of ways what it means to be righteous. What it means to be in a right relationship with God and other people. And here as he continues to preach, he points out that some people are not actually righteous. They just act 
righteous. They don't focus on honoring God. They focus on impressing other people with their spirituality. They've fallen into that same trap that I fell into back when I was a new Christian. And Jesus is making the very obvious point that you're not really righteous if your behavior flows out of such impure motives. And to reinforce this point, he's going to offer three very practical examples. We find the first one here in verses 2 to 4 where he talks about financially giving to help needy people. And in a few moments, we're going to look at his two other examples where he applies this same principle to prayer and to fasting. And in each of these areas of life, in each of these spiritual practices, Jesus wants his followers to act out of pure and sincere motives. And if you act out of false motives, Jesus says, you're a hypocrite. Now that's a loaded word. And it's a word loaded with meaning for Jesus' audience. In the Greek culture of the day, the word hypocrite referred to a professional actor. Refers to a person who's playing a role to entertain. Think about how we view actors and actresses. If we see a character on a screen in a movie, we know that there's a difference between the character on the screen... And the actor or actress who's playing that role. We know that their life off the screen will be different than their life on the screen. Because the on screen role is pretend. It's make believe. And yet a good actor or actress. A good hypocrite. Can make us believe that what's pretend is real. And Jesus is saying. That people who parade their spirituality in front of others are hypocrites. Because they're pretending. They're not living out their faith. They're simply playing a role. Spiritual hypocrites are looking for approval from the wrong audience. Because they want to impress people rather than simply honor God. And in Jesus' day, there was one group of people who fit this description, unfortunately, really well. And it's the Pharisees. They were hypocrites because their religiosity was an outward performance designed to draw attention to themselves. And so Jesus is drawing a contrast here between hypocrisy and humility. And he's saying, I want you to see the vivid difference in what a life of humility looks like. And so, for example, when it comes to helping the poor, the hypocritical giver says, look at me. And the person who gives with humility says, don't look at me, look at God. And in all areas, but particularly in this one, spiritual hypocrisy is corrupting behavior. Because it takes an act of mercy, giving to the poor. And it transforms that into an act of pride. And Jesus shows how wrong this is by describing someone. And everybody in the crowd knows he's talking about a Pharisee. He describes someone who announces his generosity with a trumpet fanfare. Now now just think about how ludicrous that is. Can you picture a Pharisee walking through town with a trumpet player by his side? And then all of a sudden, dun, 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 I just helped a poor person. It's crazy. And it's not faith. It's hypocrisy. It's play acting. It's designed to generate admiration and approval and applause from the crowd. And it's also intensely demeaning to the person that we're trying to help. That person in need is not a project. They're a human being made in the image of God who happens to need assistance. 
So Jesus has identified a problem and he offers a solution. He says there's a simple solution. Give with humility, not with hypocrisy. What matters is helping the poor, not who gets the credit. So give in secret. And in fact, rather humorously, Jesus says our giving should be so secret that we even keep it a secret from ourselves. He says, don't let your right hand know what your left hand's doing. I I think what Jesus means by that is this. We can keep our giving anonymous. We can give in such a way that people around us don't know what we're doing. But we can still dwell on it in our own minds. And we can find it easy to give ourselves lots of self-praise. Lots of self-admiration. And we can get caught up in that. And we can find ourselves saying things to ourselves like, Oh, if only people knew how generous I was. Aren't I such a great guy? And here's the point. Anytime we're performing, whether it's for the crowd or for ourselves, we're giving in to pride. And we're practicing spiritual hypocrisy. And Jesus wants us to avoid that pitfall. So he says, give discreetly. Don't give to gain attention. Give because it's the right thing to do. He's not inviting us to play a role. We're not actors and actresses. He just wants us to live out our faith with humility. And having explained this principle, and having given us an example, Jesus wants us to know that it doesn't affect just this one area of life. This principle applies to far more than just giving to the poor. And so he now offers a second example, and he applies this principle to prayer. Let's continue on in verse 5. And when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites. For they love to pray, standing in the synagogues and on the street corners, to be seen by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward in full. But when you pray, go into your room, close the door, and pray to your Father who is unseen. And then your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. And when you pray, do not keep on babbling like pagans, for they think they will be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. Hypocrites love to pray aloud. And not to connect with God, but in order to impress other people with their spirituality. And that's the reason why Pharisees loved to pray in public. And Jesus' words challenge us to do some reflecting and to try to discern if we could fall prey to that same temptation. And if we do, if we're tempted to want to pray in public, to be seen and to impress, Jesus says, I have a simple solution for you. Pray in private. Pray in private. And the reason for that is to reinforce the fact that God is really the only person who needs to hear our prayers. God is the audience. Now having said that, we need to recognize Jesus is not forbidding public prayer. And in fact, there are times when it's incredibly valuable and important to pray in public. That's how we can pray for and with each other. But based on what Jesus is saying, we need to consider who our audience is when we pray with other people. What's our motive? If I sit down to pray with you, and I'm trying to impress you, then my heart's in the wrong place. But if I sit down to pray with you, and I'm talking to God, and allowing you to listen in, then my motives are sincere. And so here's a simple test. Picture a time when you might sit down with another Christian or maybe a small group of believers and you're going to pray. And as you bow your head, as you start to pray, where does your attention go? Does your attention go to God? Or are you paying attention to the people in the group? 
wondering how they're reacting to your words, wondering if they like what you say or not. Who's our audience? What's our motive? My friend Howard told me about a very interesting experience he once had in a, in a small group. Their life group was meeting and they were having a time of prayer and they were going around the group and everyone was praying. And as Howard described it, he said, all of the mature, experienced veteran Christians were giving these long, lofty, flowery prayers. Oh, they all sounded so religious. And all of a sudden, he said, it occurred to me that we weren't really talking to God. We were thinking about each other. And we were praying to impress each other with how good we all were at praying. And then we were caught up short because there was a brand new member of the group. A guy named Joe who was a new believer. And when Joe's turn came to pray, he prayed something like this. Hey God, it's me, Joe. I'm the one who got baptized last Sunday, remember? I just want to say, thanks God. Thanks for forgiving me. Thanks for loving me. Thanks for giving me a fresh start in life. You see, Joe wasn't trying to impress anybody. He was just talking to God. And the other people in the group got to listen in. And Howard said, Joe's heartfelt, simple, sincere prayer meant so much more than all of our flowery language which was designed to impress everybody else in the room. So when you and I pray aloud, what's our motive? Who's the audience? Those are the questions that I believe Jesus' teaching forces us to wrestle with. And if we're tempted to pray publicly in order to put on a show for others, then the solution here is so simple. Just go pray in private. Jesus is very concerned that his people use the gift of prayer properly. And since he's highlighted one potential misuse of prayer, he takes the opportunity to highlight another potential misuse. It's a problem that was associated with the pagan religions of the day. The pagans worshipped multiple gods, and they tried to get what they wanted from those gods by incessant talking. And they babbled on and on and on in order to convince their gods to take action. Before we maybe laugh too much at them, it's probably good to ask ourselves, do we ever pray that way? Do we ever go on and on because we think we somehow have to talk God into doing something for us? We don't have to talk God into anything because as Jesus said, God already knows what we need before we ask. And so when we pray... We're praying to let God know that we want his counsel, we want his help, we want his involvement in the issues for which we're praying. And we're not just praying so that our circumstances will change. We're praying so that we will be changed. We should be changed as a result of an encounter with the living God. The pagans were praying to a God they thought they had to manipulate. We're not praying to a God we can manipulate. We're praying to the creator of heaven and earth who knows us better than we know ourselves. And so we pray to connect with our awesome God and then let him accomplish his purposes. And when we understand prayer that way, it means we're going to approach prayer with some humility. And we can avoid incessant babbling. We can avoid praying as a performance for others. And as he often does, Jesus in this case wants to not just spell out a principle and explain a situation where that principle applies. He wants to go a little farther and give a very practical example. And so Jesus offers a simple sample prayer for his followers to review and consider. We call it the Lord's Prayer. Prayer. And we find that starting in verse 9. This then is how you should pray, Jesus says. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, 
your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. And that's the end of the prayer, the sample prayer. But look what Jesus says next. For if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. This is such a powerful prayer. Because this prayer, like every other part of the Sermon on the Mount, offers great insights into the values of the kingdom of, of God. And we need to understand that Jesus is not offering this prayer as a rigid guideline. He's not saying, oh, every time you pray, you have to pray exactly like this. He's giving us an example. And as we can see from the flow of this message, it's an example specifically designed to help people who pray hypocritically and people who pray repetitiously. It's an example of how to pray with humility. And how to pray with a kingdom perspective. Take a minute and reflect on how the elements of this kind of prayer line up or don't line up with the way you pray. The way I pray isn't like this all the time. Because I don't often pray with a kingdom perspective. And when I do pray with a kingdom perspective, I pray differently. My prayers become less focused on me, more focused on God, and more focused on others. I find that when I pray with a kingdom perspective, I'm far less likely to pray in ways where I'm asking God to indulge my wants. And I'm far more likely to pray asking God to work in me and through me to help establish his kingdom. And I'm more likely to become a more forgiving person. And Jesus really emphasizes forgiveness here because forgiveness is a core value of the kingdom of God. And the fact is, if, if we hold a grudge against someone, if we find it hard to let go of bitterness and anger and resentment, it's going to create a barrier between us and that other person. It's going to create a barrier between us and and God. Forgiveness lies at the very heart of our faith. And a lack of forgiveness will hinder our prayers. But here is what's so powerful. When I pray regularly and spend time in the presence of God, my heart softens because I'm connecting with the God who loves to forgive. And the more time I spend in God's presence, the more ready I am to forgive people who've hurt me. Because I recognize how much I've been forgiven of by God. And then when I see how God can change me through prayer, when I see how my heart and my attitude and my behavior are changed because of this time I've spent with God, I see the value of prayer and it makes me want to pray all the more. It motivates me to pray. But here is such a critical point. None of this will happen if our prayers are play acting. If we are praying to play a role, if we're praying to impress, none of this lifestyle heartfelt change will ever happen for you or for me. Showing off in prayer changes nothing. And so for you and I to truly be transformed by God, we need to learn to pray with humility. And we do that when we begin to pray more and more from a kingdom perspective. And Jesus here shows us the way. So having addressed two core issues, giving to people in need, prayer, Jesus wants to close out this part of the sermon by highlighting one more practical example. He talks about fasting. Let's look at verse 16. When you fast, do not look somber as the hypocrites do, for they disfigure their faces to show others they are fasting. Truly I tell you, they have received their reward in full. 
But when you fast, put oil on your head and wash your face so that it will not be obvious to others that you are fasting, but only to your Father who is unseen. And your Father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. Now, fasting is a wonderful spiritual practice. It's a practice that helps us to shift our focus away from ourselves and on to God. And fasting at root is about controlling and directing our appetites. So when we fast, we're saying no to our appetite for food so that we can sharpen our appetite for God. And instead of eating, we skip a meal or two and we devote that time to prayer and Bible reading. And sadly, in this area of life, like so many others, the Pharisees were focused on impressing people. That's why they fasted. Not to get closer to God. Not to let God change them. But to impress people. They fasted twice a week on Mondays and Thursdays. And they wanted to be sure that everybody knew it and would admire them. They wanted people in town to say, oh, look, there's a Pharisee. What a spiritual giant to fast twice a week. However, you're not going to get that kind of recognition if nobody knows you're fasting. So they walked around looking all haggard and weary. They made fasting look like this incredible burden. And Jesus says, don't pretend. Wash up. In that day, putting oil on your head was a way to clean up and to smell good. And, you know, today Jesus might say, you know, take a shower. Put on some clean clothes. Brush your hair. Don't make it look like you're suffering when you fast. I find it very interesting that fasting is something that comes up time and time again in the Bible. It's been done by the people of God consistently down through the ages. Yet in our culture today, we don't find Christians fasting very much. Yet I believe it's something Jesus wants us to do from time to time. Did you notice that in verse 17, he didn't say if you fast, he said when you fast. I think he expects his followers to fast. And in response then to his teaching, I think all of us, all of us should ask, Okay, Lord, how should I fast? When should I fast? And even what appetites will I fast from? Because fasting can involve more than just food. Here's an interesting question for us to ponder. What would it be like if you and I each said, Lord, show me those appetites in my life that have too strong a grip on me. Maybe it's an appetite for shopping and spending money. Or an appetite for sports or computer games or online social media. What might it be like to fast from one of those appetites for a day? And to devote that time instead to God. To take that time and pray and read the Bible and get closer to our Heavenly Father. And the fact is fasting from any of our appetites, shifting our focus onto God and away from ourselves can be liberating. And yet if we do choose to fast, we can never forget what Jesus says here. We don't fast to show off our spirituality. Fasting is a personal, private, spiritual practice with an audience of one, God. And that principle is true for fasting. It's true for prayer and giving to the poor. And in fact, it's true for any and every spiritual practice of life. God is the audience. And and here's the bottom line of this part of Jesus' sermon. He's challenging his followers to get their priorities straight. He wants them to understand that righteousness ultimately is a matter of the heart. No matter what our outward life looks like, no matter what we look like on the outside to other people, our motives, our motives reveal whether or not we truly are following 
the way of Jesus. And Jesus picked these specific examples here in our text, these examples of giving to the poor and prayer and fasting, because there were too many people, particularly but not exclusively the Pharisees, who were engaging in those practices back in the day simply to be admired. But here's what I find. When we read the New Testament, we can easily point fingers at the Pharisees and go, oh, those guys, they sure messed up. And before we are too quick to criticize them, we need to hold up a mirror and look at our own lives. Because the fact is, there's a potential trap here for anyone. We all like to be praised. Who doesn't like to be admired? We just can't go running after that in the way that we live out our life. And one way to heighten our awareness of the potential danger that exists is to remember that Jesus is not giving us a rule that's limited to his three examples. He's giving us a principle that can extend to any area of life. And so, for example, if you have a a volunteer role here at the church or out in the community, a great question to ask is this, am I volunteering to meet a need? Am I volunteering to serve? Or am I volunteering to be noticed? Who's the audience? What's the motivation? And this can impact any one of us. I have to tell you that I wrestle with this regularly as I prepare to preach. When I'm crafting a sermon, it it is so tempting at times to want to say what I think you want to hear, not what needs to be said. And yet, if I stand up here on a Sunday morning and my goal is to try to impress you or to try to please you, then my heart and mind are in the wrong place. I've lost sight of my purpose. Because my purpose... It's to share the truth of God. That's my role in our family. And what's your role? What's your purpose? You see, for each of us in the roles and purposes to which God calls us, he wants all of us to carry them out with sincerity and with humility. And he doesn't want us to get caught up in pride-driven hypocrisy. Jesus wants us to go through life looking to God as the audience, not the people around us. Now, having said that, there's an apparent contradiction in this part of the sermon. Back in chapter 5, verse 16, Jesus said, I want you to let your light shine before other people. In other words, he said, get yourself noticed. And now here he says, no, 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 do everything in secret. So, which is it, Jesus? Jesus. Do you want me to be noticed or do you want me not to be noticed? And I believe Jesus' answer is yes. It's yes because he's addressing two different issues. In the first case, Jesus was urging people to let their faith be evident in their character and in their lifestyle. He wants people to know that he has followers. He doesn't want Christians to be spiritual cowards who keep their faith hidden. The problem he's addressing here in this part of the sermon is not spiritual cowardice, it's spiritual pride. It's one thing to pray or serve in such a way that people see me. And it's another thing to pray or serve or give in such a way that people see Jesus. That's what he wants. And so again, it comes back to motives. Jesus wants us to turn away from pride. He wants us not to fall into the trap of spiritual hypocrisy, but to live with spiritual humility, to not worry about getting credit and to point people to him. That's the way of righteousness. That's the way of Jesus. And when we follow the way of Jesus, it leads to the right rewards. Throughout this part of his sermon, Jesus talks about rewards. And he says, hypocrites, they'll get the reward thereafter. Which is, they'll get some admiration from the crowd. 
but is that really a reward that matters? I think the only reward that matters is the reward of pleasing our Heavenly Father. And the reward we're going to get from God is one that we get at the completion of this life when we step into the next life and he says, well done, good and faithful servant. And that's the only reward we should want or need. And that reward totally eclipses any kind of praise or affirmation we may get from the people around us. And you and I can receive that reward when we make the conscious choice to turn away from pride, to reject spiritual hypocrisy, and to give, and to pray, and to serve, and to live with spiritual humility. So that as we go through life, people will see Jesus Christ in each of us.